This time, I'll be showing you how I throw, trim, and attach the lines onto these simple vases. These aren't pieces with any obvious function. You could use them as a flower vase if you wanted, or to drink from. But really, I think they look best when they're lined up, like you saw at the beginning. They're made to be decorative, as opposed to functional, and they act sort of as an escape. A strain of work worlds apart from the otherwise endless repetition of mugs and bowls and teapots and so on. Each one of these is different, and making these groups forces me to produce work in a different way, a slower way, with each pot needing its own approach and own consideration. You might have noticed that the pottery I make isn't too decorative. I've always found myself liking more simple and plain ceramics, with neutral colours and tones and straightforward forms. Ultimately, I want to create ceramics that I can imagine myself living with and using, so I try as I might to make work that fits that criteria, rather than making work that fits what other people want, as I feel that that approach will fundamentally make pots that are most in line with my character. So when it did come to seeking out a way of decorating pots, really I was searching for something simple. A mark, or a line, or a protrusion, something that didn't distract too much from the form of the pot itself but also gave it a direction, or a face, so to speak. And the very simple lines that I attach to each of these pots, I think does just that. I think as a potter, and as a maker of tableware, it can help to explore another range of work, which isn't necessarily made to fit any utilitarian use. Rather, it's just a beautiful object, for a beautiful object's sake. Something that you might display on a wall, or on a mantle, or in a gallery, and it can help to push your work in another direction in tangent with your tableware, one accompanying the other, as if people are interested in your work. There'll always be a few who are interested in purchasing more significant collections and artistic pieces. Anyhow, that's quite enough of that. Let's talk about the pot in hand. For each one of these, I start off with one pound of clay, so about 453 grams. They're thrown very thinly, and I follow a few set rules, so that the pots follow and fit my aesthetic. Is ultimately all the pots that I make, I want them to be obviously recognisable as my own work, as opposed to somebody else's, which is something much easier said than done. So I throw each form to have a narrow base, and I keep any change in direction very angular and sharp too. I want there to be plenty of edges and ridges that my glazes can interact with later on, and really that's what the line, which is attached later once the pot has been trimmed, is all about. Often it travels down from the rim like a continuation of that sharp lip, which allows the colour change that often occurs around the tops of these pots to traverse down the vessel itself. So as I throw these, I usually start with a rough shape that tapers slightly outward, and then as time goes by, and I can see sort of what the vessel will end up looking like, I throw it to a more exacting shape. Then, once the pot's nearing completion, I remove the skirt of clay around the base, remove the water from the inside with a sponge on the stick, and then I take my metal kidney, offer it up to the walls, and from the inside of the pot, I push outward against the metal. What I'm not doing is pushing the metal directly into the pot, as doing so on quite a thin and delicate vessel can easily cause it to deform or twist and buckle, which would ruin the piece, whereas pushing out against the tool mitigates this. But I also don't stress if there are too many throwing lines left, as long as the form is correct as once these pots have turned leather hard a day or so later, I'll easily be able to trim them away. And finally I just soften the rim with a chamois leather. Once the first pot's been thrown, I roughly set my throwing gauge. I'm not accurately measuring anything here, but by having it set, I can easily throw all the pots that'll come after this to approximately the same height. The pot is then wired off, and then I scrape as much of the excess slip off of my hands as possible. I have a plastic bucket next to my wheel, that serves this purpose, which also has a sharp plastic edge, perfect for scraping the slip off. I then carefully lift away the pot and set it aside, ready to throw the next. Whenever I'm working on the wheel, you might notice that both of my hands are interlocking in some way. This adds stability and strength to all of the movements that I do during this process. I begin by coning the clay up and down a number of times, compressing it between my hands and letting it rise up before squashing it back down. And with each cone, you can sort of feel the lump of clay become more even, and it almost feels as if it's running more smoothly between your fingers. I then use a thumb and an index finger to gently push into the very center, and then I pull them out together towards my body, 
to form the base, which for these I probably leave to be about half a centimetre thick. I then dig my knuckle into the clay on the outside, and on the inside I press outward with the pads of my fingers, and by raising them up together in a nice even consistent movement, and the walls of your pots will begin to get taller and thinner. Essentially, we're trying to thin the walls out so that they're one even thickness throughout the whole vessel, from top to bottom. What we definitely don't want is a piece that feels bottom heavy. A pot can have heft as long as that weight is balanced throughout the entire piece, instead of all being situated in the bottom. So once again, I reach my hands down into the bottom corner of the pot. I squeeze them together, creating a ring of clay, which I'll then pull very slowly and gradually all the way to the top. Once the pot's rim nears my throwing gauge's pointer, I can then begin to define the shape. I start by pulling clay away from the bottom to form the narrow base, and then I pull it up and outward to form the angled waist. And for this piece, I wanted the top section just to be simple and straight. When I'm making these groups, I want each one to be different from the other, so if some are more simple than the other more angled vessels, then I don't mind, as long as they work together as a group. The excess water is removed, and then I go back to my metal kidney to define the shape and to remove as much excess slip from the outside form as I can. If I were to leave the outside covered in slip, the pot would actually be very difficult to remove once I've wired it off, as even if I gently clasped it with two hands and lifted it away to place it on the wearboard by my side, the slip on the pot would stick to my hands and I couldn't place it down neatly. So if you do want to lift pots away like this, having dry hands and a dry pot, relatively, is really essential. I usually make these pots in batches of about six or so. I do sell them individually, but also if a group of six of them work really well together, I do prefer to sell them as one collection, in a similar way to how you saw them at the start, in a row, next to each other, forms altering from piece to piece, lines too. So in this video, You'll see me throwing six of them, trimming six of them, and then at the end I'll show you how I attach the lines and model them to be straight and sharp. One challenge when making these is trying to create forms that are different time and time again while still following the set parameters that I give myself. There's really only so many forms you can do, but the addition of a protruding line afterwards increases greatly the amount of different forms you can make, and having spent a number of years making these now, only ever in small batches. It has influenced how I make other pieces too, especially lidded jars and teapots. I'll take a form that worked well for these lined vessels, and then I'll attempt to make it into a lidded form, and then even a teapot. Some work, some don't, some become too complicated, and I've certainly disposed of quite a few before even firing them. That's one of the good things about clay. It's recyclable up until that point, so nothing's wasted, but a lot is learnt. I like to use relatively firm clay for these, nothing too soft. As I centre, I lean my upper body weight onto my arms which are tucked into my waist. I also lean my arms onto the plastic chassis of the wheel tray, anything to keep my arms as stable and in control as possible. As wet clay like this really isn't a strong material, it shouldn't easily be able to influence what your arms do, especially with such a small lump like this. I also squeeze the base of the lump of clay with the little finger on each hand. As I'm centering, this prevents the clay from splaying outward and then underneath your hands, which then often causes a slight undulation and causes your hand to wobble up and down as you're centering, which is never a good thing. But sometimes there's nothing much you can do to stop an undulation, like you can see in the rim here. So if I can, I'll compress it down like so to keep it under control. And it's only if it gets much worse later on that I'll clean it up with a potter's needle. Sometimes for my last pull, I'll use the tip of my index finger to really pinch in the clay at the bottom. I might not pull this all the way to the top, but if it does get any excess weight out of that lower section of the pot, then that's a good thing. Once the form is more or less there, I can begin the finishing off procedures 
which starts by scraping away this excess clay around the base. Then I scrape away excess slip and clean over the form. Then I use a chamois leather to soften the rim, wire the pot off of the wheel and then carefully lift it onto the wearboard. As these are quite thin pots, I try to keep some amount of thickness in the rim when I'm making these. It helps to hold together the shape when you lift them off the wheel, as if they're really very thin. The process of picking them up and moving them to one side can be enough to alter the form. And anyway, I can always trim the rim to be thinner later on, so it isn't absolutely necessary to get the pot as finished as possible at this stage. There are times when it's just easier to do the finishing work at the trimming stage as opposed to when it's freshly thrown and very soft. You'll notice as I lift the pot away from the wheel that at the same moment I lift, I also spin the wheel. This can help to break any sticky seal that might be between the two. Another important thing I do here is I don't remove the pad of clay that's left over from the previous pot. As long as it isn't wet and is instead quite sticky and dry, it'll help the next ball of clay that's thrown onto it to really adhere firmly. It's for a similar reason too that I remove lots of the slip off my wire before sliding it underneath the pot. As if your wire is covered in slip and you drag that beneath the pot, the slip can essentially help to stick the two components back together and it may make it more difficult to lift the pot away from the wheel cleanly. This is the last of the six forms and with these I never know precisely what I'm going to throw when I slam the ball of clay down. I just know that it has to be different from those already made, albeit only a subtle difference. Whenever I throw cylindrical forms, I always try to angle my clay inward, like so, at least for the first couple of pulls. I don't want the clay to splay out too much early on, so by keeping the form quite straight and collared in, you tend to have more control, as if the cylinder gets too thin towards the top and quite open, it can be very difficult to collar it back in to a tight, narrow opening. Lubrication is paramount to this process, be it water or slip. If your hands dry out as you're pulling the clay up, or the pot does, one will stick to the other, and when they stick, it can cause the pot to twist and buckle, and ultimately the pot may come slightly off centre, so as soon as I feel that my hand is getting too dry, or the pot is, I just dip my hand in water and I'll pour it over the walls and onto my hands. All it takes when throwing is to make one wrong movement to ruin the whole piece, but like I mentioned previously, any clay that's wasted at this stage can simply be recycled and reused, with very minimal effort too, which is one of the qualities about ceramics which makes it quite unique. Clay, as a raw material, is really very cheap, and it's incredibly abundant in the world too. That being said, as time goes by, many of the materials that potters use are becoming more and more refined and are being processed in different ways, which don't always make them as suitable for throwing pots with or for mixing glazes. In fact, there are quite a few rather sought after old materials like the classic blue Cornish stone or certain variants of felspar and other such materials that these days you just can't get your hands on very easily. So who knows what the future holds? Certainly one day when I don't live in the city I want to try including more local materials in the pots I make, be it dug up clay, granite or anything else I can get my hands on. When it comes to lifting pots off, there's actually quite a lot I could discuss. All I'm doing is touching the pot until there's a very light contact on most of my hands. But most of the pressure is around the lower part of my palms and my little fingers. You don't want to touch the upper portions of the wall. Rather, it's better to lift mostly from the bottom. So I gently cup the pot with as much contact as I can. I'm not squeezing. And then I just twist and lift. And as the pot is so sticky, it should just sort of lift away with your hands. And if you do want to correct the form at this freshly thrown stage, lift the pot from the bottom and let it settle back into place, rather than touching the rim, as you'll likely only make it worse. Now these have been thrown, I'll let them sit out until they're leather hard, which is usually by the following day. Trimming of any kind is probably my favourite process in this craft. Ever since receiving my bison trimming tools, I've been keeping most of them in this little protected box, just so nothing can accidentally roll onto the floor and shatter as the tungsten carbide blades are really brittle. I attach the pots to the wheel by brushing a little bit of slip onto the base, and then I rub it firmly until it's directly in the centre of the wheel head. 
and with these there isn't too much to trim away from the top sections. It tends to just be this lower half, where most of the mass is removed. I can only throw this part so thin, and it still maintains some kind of structural integrity. Equally, if I were to initially throw it as narrow as I wanted it to be once trimmed, it would make many of the finishing procedures that are done to the pot far more difficult, so I'd rather leave it with a bit of thickness, and then trim it to be far more narrow at this stage. Otherwise, I can trim these quite quickly. All I'm doing is trimming each plane to be flat, so I try to remove as many throwing rings as possible, as these do impact how easily you can attach the line later on. The flatter the surface, the better. I remove the pot, wipe clean the surface, and then place it back down. The cleanup is quite important, as I don't want any bits of clay to get stuck in or damage the delicate rim. So I make sure the metal wheel head is as clean as it can possibly be before I place the pot back down. To help keep the pot held firmly down in place, I use one of these nylon spinners, which is custom made by a man called Richard Carter, who you can find on Facebook if you search his name and pottery. I think he's taking orders for these, but you need to inquire personally with him. There's a ball bearing between the black section of the tool and the white, so I push through the black section and then the white section spins with the pot, and the tool helps to keep the pot really firmly in place as I trim the lower half of the vessel. And I should mention, this isn't an ad or anything, he was just kind enough to send me these in the post, and I've loved using them, so the least I can do is give him a shout out. And I'll leave a link to his Facebook page down in the description below. Once these have been trimmed, they're much thinner, and the clay that's revealed underneath tends to be quite a bit softer too. So before I attach their lines, I let them sit out for quite a while to give them time to dry out and firm up. Otherwise the process of attaching the line would deform them terribly. To attach the pot even more, I use a rubber kidney just to squash down a tiny portion of the wall into the wheel head. And this is really my preferred method of trimming, as it means there are no lumps of clay that get in the way or no mechanical holding arms. But it is also a bit more risky and you need to be quite confident in how well you can attach it to the wheel, as eventually it will dislodge and fly off, which is why I generally keep my left hand somewhere on the vessel, ready to catch it if that does happen. Once the outside surfaces are done, I slide a knife underneath to separate it from the wheel, and then flip it over to trim the base. The spinner is tap centered into place, and then I can begin to trim and watch the back of my hands here. You can see that I'm connecting the two, resting the ball of my thumb on my left hand onto the thumb of my right hand. Like I mentioned previously when I was throwing, I always try to connect both hands in some way as I'm working. With trimming especially, it's so important that your movements are kept controlled and very steady. At this point, I absolutely don't want the clay to influence what my tool does. If there's a very slight undulation or bump, I want to trim through it, rather than letting that undulation dictate what my tool does, in which case the bump only becomes more and more exaggerated with each rotation of the pot. If instead each of these forms was identical, like my mugs or bowls for instance, I would throw a chuck that fits snugly into the inside form, which would certainly speed up the trimming process, as each one is just slotted over the chuck, but as each one is different, it means I need to treat each with a different approach, and that becomes even more apparent when I attach the lines onto these. And this form, in particular, is probably the most difficult to do that to, as the attached protruding line will travel from the rim down into the groove created by those two planes, and then back down. But I enjoy the challenge, and I enjoy the pace at which these make me work. It's much slower as compared to when I make mugs or bowls, and I find myself thinking about the actual form so much more. You may also notice whenever I'm trimming that I hold the tool right near the end, close to the blade. This gives you a lot more control and it also means you can push a lot harder into the clay, which helps to remove mass far more quickly. This is opposed to holding the tool on the far end of the handle, like I do see some people occasionally doing, which grants you practically no control, so any bump or undulation will simply be exaggerated as the trimming tool bounces on them. And it also means that you'll spend far more time trimming, as you'll only remove very small ribbons of clay, as you can barely exert any pressure with the tool. 
So positioning is key, as is too the speed of your wheel, which, when you're trimming and if you're aiming for consistency, should be kept quite fast. That being said, if you are watching this, I think it's important to remember that most of the tips or the advice that I give may only really be applicable if you're making work that's like mine. If your pots are thrown more freely, they can be trimmed more freely. And of course, not everything has to have straight edges and sides and carefully trimmed feet. That's just how I've chosen to make my pots. And the tips that I offer, I guess, just reflect that. What makes ceramics such a brilliant craft is the sheer breadth of variety. Beyond just the endless ways of making different forms and shapes, there's the infinite world of glazes and how they combine with different slips, clay bodies, and other glazes too. Simply put, there is no one way of doing things. But I've also always been a potter that has been quite obsessed with obtaining a certain fluency with the craft. I think you can only obtain a certain level of freedom after you've achieved a certain level of mastery. And once you've obtained a certain level of skill, you can go back and you can make pots in all manner of ways. And they'll still retain that level of skill. Even if they look like they're naive or crude, they most certainly won't be. And I definitely think I'm nowhere near that level yet. I'm still young, relatively. 28 years old, and I've been in potter's studios and watched master potters throw, and their level of skill simply blows me away, and often it makes me question what it is that I'm really searching for in this craft. Is it to reach a certain level of skill and ability, or is it to find and nurture an aesthetic and style that I can truly call my own? I don't think I know the answer to that, and if I'm still making videos in 50 years time, maybe then I'll be able to give you an answer to that. But for now, I'm just happy making and learning, still, as I go. And lastly, I stamp the pot with my maker's mark and move on to the next pot, which I think is the last. All of the trimmings that you see here will be recycled. I have a big reclaimed bucket that sits directly to the left of my wheel, and as my wheel tray fills up, I occasionally shovel some of these trimmings into the bucket, where they quickly slake down in the water, turning into a sludge, which can eventually be piled out onto a plaster bat, which absorbs much of the excess moisture, and once it's the same consistency as the clay that I would get fresh from the bag, I wedge it up, ready to use again, which makes for an endless cycle in the studio that's constantly repeating itself. And that's it for the trimming. Now we can finally move on to attaching the delicate lines that you've heard me talk about so much during this video. But before I do that in reality, I let these sit like this, upside down for about an hour or so, depending on what the weather's like of course, so that they can firm up enough ready to have the lines joined on. I begin by just placing this piece of wood down onto the wheel, which simply acts as an additional workbench. Then. I carefully roll out a coil of clay, one that's as even as possible, and believe me, I tried out a multitude of techniques before landing on this one, some which made the process just so excessively complicated, when in fact what worked best was maybe the most straightforward method of them all. I wet a portion of the pot, and then lay the coil of clay over it, pushing it quite firmly in place, from on top, and from the sides, like so. I then snip away the excess on top, and then... With a wetted finger, I glide it over top, trying to make it as even as possible, so that it protrudes the same amount throughout the entire length. I then pinch two fingers together, wet them and run them over the line, sort of extruding the line as I go. I then take the sharp end of this metal tool, which is straight, and carefully pinch the clay away either side of the line, making it much finer and sharper too. I really want it to be an edge that'll break through the glaze that's coated over it. And this really is slow, tedious work. One piece might take 10 minutes to do, 15 minutes, I don't really count. It's just finished when it looks good, when the line is consistent, neatly finished either side, and uniformly sharp. The process of doing this can cause the circular shape of the pot to become slightly oval. So every now and then, if I feel that's happening, I will press it back into a circular shape. Additionally, if the line gets too wet, I'll blast it with a heat gun just for a few seconds before continuing to refine it. This can also stop 
the wall of the pot itself from becoming too wet, which can cause the walls lower down to distort if you're not careful. I then carefully set them aside and I will cover them with plastic relatively quickly just so the line doesn't dry out way too rapidly as they will crack if not dried slowly. But really I'm hand carving here, it's quite delicate work and it's very easy to muck the line up which I have and still do occasionally do, in which instance I remove the line, trim the outside surface of that part of the pot again very carefully, wait a moment and then attach it again. And you can see here just how fine it is. I feel like it gives the pot a face almost, an obvious direction from which to view it from and display it. And it's the pieces like this that take the longest, where the line travels all the way from the top of the rim down to the base. Again, I attach the line onto an area that I've previously wetted and then push it down firmly throughout the entire length. I think it's worth mentioning here that these attached lines will move as the pot dries. The clay will twist slightly as the pot turns bone dry and even when it fires too. But on this scale it's barely noticeable and on these slightly wider forms. Whereas if you're attaching lines to much narrower cylinders, the amount the line moves can be a lot and it can go from looking straight at this stage to completely curved once fired which is always a bit of a disappointing shock when it does happen. And it really does take a lot of trial and error to figure out the best way of attaching them, which often means you need to attach them slightly offset to the left so that when they fire, they twist into the right position. And that's it for these pots. Now I'll just dry them very slowly beneath plastic so the lines don't crack off. But I love how they look at this stage, the delicate line before the vessels are covered in a layer of glaze. So I place them on a plastic lined board and the lines at this point are dry enough that the plastic that will be wrapped around them won't damage them. Then if they do look like they're turning a tiny bit bone dry around the rims, I do quickly spray them with some water and then I wrap them up tightly but they'll stay for a couple of days drying out slowly. And that's it. Thanks for watching. There's a multitude of different things in this video. Tips, stories, my philosophy on making and I hope you found some of it interesting and not too much of a ramble perhaps. Anyway, I'll see you next week.